Mark, you're worthy in podcast all day. All day. Dream by night. <laughs> Don't buy me a drink. Just give me 10 bucks. Hey, all day. <laughs> Go down to the strip club with your floppy disk and turn it into a hard drive. Yeah, right. You'll get fucking thrown out by Big Tony. <laughs> We're here to name names and make people feel more ashamed for shit that they're not proud of. Don't blow it. Keep it simple. Count your money. No, oh, whatever it is. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? Welcome to the Marky Worthington Comedy Podcast. This is episode 50, the big 5-0, and just like any 50, we got a uh, very special ge- uh, guest for the uh, the milestone episode. Um, you may have recognized this guest from uh, Q&A, um, Celebrity Name Game, The Project, <laughs> everything else on the, um, on the Wikipedia page that everyone has probably already looked up. In case you haven't already guessed it, it's Tom Ballard. <laughs> Of course they've guessed it from those incredible credits. It's me. (laughs) Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, man. Congratulations on 50 episodes. Yeah, that's right. Two two a month now and I'm up to 50, so slowly getting through it. (laughs) Huge. Who's been your favorite? Obviously, this one will be, but like, Um, jumping out at you, what's what's been your number one? (laughs) To to be honest, before this, I, um, I didn't realize, but I'd actually made like a mental note to find whoever Bill Burr said was the Australian comedian that opened for him called Daniel something or other. And I didn't realize until midway through the Daniel Muggleton episode, it was actually him. So it was like, I got through the, most of the way through the episode, I was happy that I had Daniel on there. And then I'm like, holy shit, you were the dude that I wanted to have on anyway. So it was like a double hitter. (laughs) You're actually good. It's actually good to be talking to you, Michael. It's like, well, you've you're on my list of guests that I'd like, but now you're on my like you've moved up into like an A lister, like from from like a from like a <laughs> like a good to have to a like bucket lister. Number one, we interviewed Bill Burr on uh, on Triple J Breakfast once, and uh, man, it, it was a brutal combination of like. You know, I love him, he's a brilliant comedian, but he hated doing breakfast radio. And I was just trying to communicate to him that I wasn't one of those crappy breakfast radio DJs that I'm sure he's talked to all across the States all the time. <laughs> but the only way you can do, you, you can't do that. You just come across as, as one of those shitty DJs who's trying to be cool and try to get in his good graces. So I hope that he's forgotten that interview and never thinks about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, man, um, it just, just I'll just let him know now, uh, Bill. We didn't mean it. Um, like it's <laughs> when you're tuning in just to see when I, my next open mic is, so you can watch it. Um, just yeah, just just want you to know it's all good. Uh, <laughs> Bill, keep it real. Thanks, thanks for being a fan of the show. Yeah, he'll be excited about fifty episodes. <laughs> hey man, um, if he plays his cards right, maybe he'll be in one of the uh, milestone episodes down the track. But um, Ooh, huge. Yeah, it's always good to support our colleagues. But um, <laughs> um, I do. I listen to the Monday Morning podcast and um, with Bill Burr, and he um, basically was talking about how um, he he like pays out those those like um, morning breakfast radio where it's like the sound samples are like, hey, you've got Tom in in the AM, like that sort of. Um, um, and to be honest, I'm only a gold microphone away from being that that type of person. But um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Your energy level is it's good. It's good for live stream, relaxed podcast chat. But that that zoo crew shit is like, yeah, is you plus a thousand energy points and a lot more sound effects and like <laughs> and triple M and <laughs> a lot more of that. So unless you add them into this little production, I think you're you're fine. Uh, I do have like a couple of sound samples. Like I've got um, at the start of the year. And in this episode, because I'm doing it live, I'll just have like a rolling start, the same start as we had here. But normally um, people who listen to the show would know that I have like a little intro before the actual episode. Right. And um, the start of that is just a bunch of sound samples of like shit that I say in the episode. But it's literally not like hyped up it's the exact same tone that i have right now but it's the intro it doesn't really instill like just like erratic behavior it's just like oh i've already started listening to the episode but it's just shorter parts but i do have one little sample there which i like which is i accidentally just um came across it because i was looking for like a bit to separate the intro and the actual episode 
And um, from the episode, I did an episode with uh, Dane Simpson like earlier in the in the show um, show's history, and uh, I was so like we kind of had this massive conversation before the episode, and then I was like, okay, now for the podcast, and I'm like, mm-hmm. we just did like an hour podcast beforehand, just hanging out. And then I had to be like, oh, now for the podcast. And I, I do a metal podcast where I used to where just like um, interview bands and review albums and stuff. And um, it was called, it's called Canberra Metalheads. And I'd be like, welcome to Canberra Metalheads with your host, Marky. And like, but now I get Dane on the show and I'm like, welcome to the Marky Worthington comedy podcast with your host, Marky Worthington. And he, <laughs> he was like, I like how it's the Marky Worthington comedy podcast with... Marky Worthington. Marky Worthington. Well, you may not always be the host. You know, maybe someone like, you know, I don't know, a well known respected comedian who's desperate for media gigs after a pandemic might hustle in and start presenting this this program. And there'll be the Marky Worthington comedy program with with Tom Bella. <laughs> You'll be edged out, man. Yeah. And I'll cut, get a sweet cut of your streaming profits. Well, if that's selling out, I'm 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 doing it. <laughs> I'm not trying to look to be fair if I can either get somewhere between that and the next like club comic sort of Doug Stanhope um fucking um like road warrior then that's that's like a happy balance right <laughs> somewhere in there yeah so um you're talking about radio before and you did some time um first of all um with your this, this is me pulling up your Wikipedia page again just so that I don't accidentally screw it up um, now that I've said that, watch me do it. Watch me just do it to, for the for the lulls. Um, but anyway, the um, you, you early days of of your uh, comedy sort of started on radio. Is that um, is that sort of like the um, what got your foot in the door, or how he got to talking live, or that sort of stuff? Is that sort of still reflect uh, on today? Not yeah, not quite. Well, I, I I wanted to be an actor, so I was doing all this amateur musical theater in my hometown of Warrnambool in country Victoria. Then I did Class Clowns when I was fourteen, which is the high school competition that the comedy festival runs, mm-hmm. um, because just because it was another way to get attention and to get on stage. And that and for that you just had to come up with five minutes of stand up mm-hmm. um, or or a sketch comedy um, act or whatever you wanted to do. I did that terrible material, but I had a level of confidence thanks to public speaking competitions and my amateur musical theater experience and kind of got addicted to stand up that way and kept doing class clowns, ended up doing raw. Um, but I was doing community radio with my good friend, Alex Dyson mm-hmm. um, on three way FM in Warrnambool. And then when Triple J saw me in the Raw final, they said, hey, have you considered radio? And I said, well, I do this thing with Alex Dyson. I don't know if it constitutes radio, but have a listen. And we sent in a cassette <laughs> of that. And they said, this is truly terrible, but we can work with this and uh, and hopefully make it into something. And, uh, yeah, that's how we ended up at working for Triple J. Yep. Yeah, we actually have um, – there's a Class Clown um, finalist um, that performs here in Canberra, I think took it out um, – a little while ago, um, Ethan Kirk, I think his name is. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he he's really good. He's but it's like it reminds me of the first getting into comedy where you've got your solid five minutes and you're just like, I can get people to laugh with this, and it's like that tried tested. He's talking about like, you know, high school and like parties and that sort of stuff, and you're like, oh, I remember that stuff, man. <laughs> How lame's homework? Am I right, everybody? <laughs> they start making like specific references to like Mrs. Jones in English. <laughs> it was a lot of yeah, class clowns was fun. Yeah, and and then a lot of the comedy was uh, yeah, school based and like how lame school is and we're all awkward sexually. Hmm. But um, yeah, once you leave high school, you should probably stop doing stuff <laughs> about your eight. <laughs> well, I I started comedy. Um like in my early 20s so I was kind of like past that but the thing is I'd been writing jokes since I was in high school in the thought that one day I'd give it a crack so I Mm -hmm. had these like silly jokes that I wrote when I was like 18 that I thought were like good and when I went through my notes I ended up doing um all I could think about was this set that I this joke that I had about like um the Melbourne Cup some some like bullshit that i made up about the melbourne cup and give us uh, the joke come on okay. come on oh Down no 
Well, I thought I was bad enough telling it in front of a few people at Smith's Alternative in the in the city, a small cafe there, but now I'm telling it in front of one of one of the world stage committee. Okay, anyway, so um <laughs> one of the all time greats. No, basically it was a it was a joke along the lines of like um the saying, Don't look a gift horse in the mouth or in the teeth right. or whatever it is. I can't even remember. Um and um In the mouth. I don't think in the it's mouth. in the teeth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't look a horse, a gift horse in the teeth is an incredible expression that someone should start saying a lot more. But sorry, go on. Um, the teeth. The teeth. Um, yeah. It's like I, I blamed not remembering the joke. I, it's actually just the saying altogether I don't remember. Um, that, the saying is stupid, sure. Um, I and I was I saying like, oh, so basically if um, someone gives me a horse, I'm not meant to question it. So someone walks up with like a hessian sack filled with what was a horse. Am I meant to just enter it in the Melbourne Cup and just out of cute, like just out of good, gracious, like gift giving, just jump on where the horse's back would be and start pretending I'm in the Melbourne Cup, looking the guy dead in the eye and being like, thanks for giving me this horse, mate. <laughs> Okay, it's a little, it's a little bloated that joke. I reckon you could probably cut it down and hide <laughs> it up a little bit, and you could probably workshop it a little bit more. Okay, before doing it on the gala. But um, <laughs> some people okay. call this a podcast. Let me be honest. I used it as an excuse to workshop my first set ever with Tom Ballard. And if other people want to right. tune into that, that's their fault. Don't look at a gift horse in the teeth. <laughs> I always say, <laughs> take it. If all smart so enough. Did you ever do that? Did you ever do that joke on stage? Yeah, so I that, so the problem was I had the full set that was really intricate, really wordy. I wrote the whole thing out and um, re rehearsed it and recited it. And then I got on stage for the first time ever and forgot it and just went into my rant about the Melbourne Cup because that's what I could <laughs> remember. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, mate. Well, this is how we learn and grow. <laughs> what, what's the deal now with? Are you, can you guys do any gigs at the moment? Or are you are you still locked down here? Uh, so what? currently, um, we're not doing any physical like in person gigs, um, mm -hmm. but we do have. Um, Chris Ryan runs a um, weekly Zoom open mic. Oh, yeah. um, for the last couple of weeks and everyone's just been jumping on that for now. But um, there's gigs planned for. Um, next month. So basically from the 29th of October, some venues will be able to host um, gigs depending on the size. Um, and I've got one planned for the 2nd of November at the venue that I work at called The Basement because they got like a, they, I think they got, um, with one person per four square meters, they hit the, the limit of a hundred people. So that's enough to run a, run a gig for, for, for them. So yeah, sure. So starting from then, what about yourself? Well, yeah, I haven't been doing anything. I've got a gig on this Thursday night, the, the Comedy Republic's, like, you know, streaming mm -hmm. um, from, from that venue, Comedy Connection, it's a cool lineup of comedians that will all be, yeah, there'll be no one in the audience, but we're just sort of streaming out on Zoom. I've, I haven't done much in the way of Zoom events over the course of the pandemic mm. because um, I think I did one or two and they were um, very, de very depressing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And I have full respect for the people who've kept it going and put up the private gigs. I think that's awesome, but I just, yeah, it just hasn't been for me. Yeah. But I just now it's just thinking about the idea of doing stand up again and what that means or look like or what the hell to talk about. I still have absolutely no idea. <laughs> You're gonna do an hour of COVID jokes? Well, this is it. I did a show. We did the comedy festival this year yeah. in Melbourne, yep. and 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 my show was about like 2020, about mm. COVID and Black Lives Matter and and the bushfires. And, you know, the first 25 minutes was sort of the pandemic. And that felt like a real, that felt okay to me. It felt like a big relief. It felt like a reflection on the last year. And, yep. you know, if you do, if you work hard enough so you don't just have the first thought pandemic COVID jokes, then I think people people can enjoy it and relate to it. But this time around, I'm just like, like this lockdown for, for, for Melbournians, I think it was being really brutal. And so whether at festival time next year they want anyone wants to think about this at all i i have no idea but then it's all i can think about and yeah. and it's consumed my 2021 and <laughs> pushed me to some weird <laughs> depressed identity questioning yeah. positions that that's all i can think about where i'm to the point where i'm like what's even the point of doing setup comedy <laughs> or anything at all so yeah i don't know i don't know what will happen am i even human like one of those what like... even is this <laughs> bro <laughs> And then, and then I feel guilty because there's lots of people doing it harder than me, and I, I'm just, 
getting money from the government to sit at home all day watching um, Hannibal. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, what the fuck am I complaining about? But then also I've been very, very weird and sad. Anyway. Mm. Well, <laughs> <dude>. too, too heavy. <laughs> Let's go back to talking about the Melbourne Cup. That's good. <laughs> I think that's fucking just as, imp- as depressing. But... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Um, to be honest, I um, have to say with Hannibal, uh, suit game on point. Incredible, right? The whole thing. I've watched it. Tw- I watched it in full, for the first time in full last year, and then watched it all again this time around. I just just think it's an extremely well made show. Yeah, it's creepy and sexual and arousing, and I don't know why. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it looks great. It's like suits, but sexier. <laughs> Um, not quite as vicious as lawyers, though. <laughs> Same vibe. Um, one se- like Aussie series that I liked was the uh, Mister in Between. Have not watched that. Okay, but that's great. Yeah, 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 really good. Um, it was for me. It was like relatable because I usually watch a lot of like American um, produced content, and um, it was just good to watch a series where someone will just walk into a room and be like, how's it going? And I'll be like, <laughs> that would be like the one guy's line for the, for the whole scene. That was it. That's the whole like, He'll just walk. Is he... Yeah, sorry. He'll is just he walk. Is he in America and... though? Uh, or is it all shot in Australia? No, it's, uh, it's, it's all shot in Australia. There's like a lot of like bush scenes and stuff, like where he'll just like, you know, it's, it's, it's based in Sydney, but he'll like go to like the Blue Mountains for some scenes in it and things like that. So it is it is very like Australian heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's cool though. It's cool to watch something that's um, relatable. <laughs> Isn't he a hitman killing people? Yeah. Well, look, the image of myself. <laughs> <laughs> right. You talk no. like you, and you're also. A murderer. Yeah, that, that's so, no. <laughs> I just get you. In my mind, I'm not really. Do, do you think that I relate myself to the main character? I don't have that much of an ego problem. Like the the, <laughs> more, I relate like myself. Victim. Sorry. You're more like a victim. Yeah, I'm more like either the victim or the mate that like has to like help him when he gets stuck somewhere. You know, rocks up at like two in the morning and is just like, all right, I suppose I'll help you out. That's more so me. I'm. <laughs> Like there's a, <laughs> there, there's a, um, there's a, there is one scene that involves like a, um, like an, as a glamorized, like, um, actor version of a bikey, like a, like a, like a, like a Hollywood version of what they think of, like a Sons of Anarchy looking pretty boy bikey. And I'm like, that's the closest I've ever come to picturing myself being on the big screen. <laughs> That's you up there. <laughs> I haven't watched Sons of Anarchy either, but I hear that's it's 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 well. great. Okay. But um, yeah, it's one of those things. Like, there's so many, so much content to catch up on. It's all over the place. Um, I I remember so there's a Canberra comedian. I don't know if you've ever worked with um Tom Gibson, who um used to have a bit about a bike. And I'm not going to repeat. Obviously, I'll, I'll burn my own open mic on the show. But I'm not my first ever open mic. Um. But yeah, he, he had this bit about um, a bikey that um, lived near him and how this whole uh, cute little neighbourhood was up in arms about it. And um, the best time I ever seen that was when one of the guys sitting next to me in the in the audience was just staring at the side of my head thinking that I was going to get mad about it. <laughs> Just stand up and you're offended just, on behalf of on, on bikey bike. appearing people. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> what kind? Of, like, do you think I'm about to stand up like and be like, you know, how, you, how dare you speak about bearded people like that? <laughs> An outrage. An outrage. Are you fully tatted as well? Do you have any tats? Um, no, d- despite like the... Um, the like everybody look at me vibe that I give off, um, like and, and the stand up comedy that all that comes with it. Um, the uh, I, I just sort of have a few tattoos, but nothing, nothing crazy. I I still do have to um, try and get a day job at some point. I haven't fully committed to the comedy life. <laughs> 
very practical of you. Yeah, well, for now, it, it works. Um, let me, uh, I'll just uh, quickly do a quick shout out to um, our. Um, Um, Asylum Seeker Resource Center um, donation um, location. So Tom's done today's episode based on um, donations for me. So this is this really cool of him to do that. Um, and so head on over to um, asrc.org.au forward slash donate and uh, donate away there um, to uh, help support the um, cause because um, without that, then, you know, we wouldn't be. Uh, it's hard to fund things without donations, right? Like it all comes down to, <laughs> all comes down to how much the public can help. So yeah, get behind that. I've yeah, put a link. Oh uh, yeah, thanks for that, man. But yes, ASRC are yeah center in Melbourne that that are entirely based on people's donations. They take no government support whatsoever to maintain their independence, and they advocate on behalf of people seeking asylum. But they also provide like food and stuff that you need to live a decent life um so it's also like yeah literally a resource center for people seeking asylum and people on um visas to rock up and uh get a helping hand and they've been amazing during the pandemic they're always amazing but particularly during the pandemic and if you've got some spare cash which everyone does i'm sure at this time um if you're in a position to give you can chip in some cash that'd be right yep just showing the screen now so there's um donation uh, brackets or you can set up um monthly um donation amounts so just chucking that one in there and now back into uh, into chatting. And Mark, you committed to donate $2,000, is that right, is, for, before we started? Oh, um, yeah. Before um, your open mic money, is that what you were doing? Yeah. yeah, so uh, funds really raised. Generous, I mean, that, uh, well, really I, let me just reword that. Uh, funds raised from this episode, once they hit $2,000, will be donated. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. That's not right at all. <laughs> I said up to the value of two thousand. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> anything over that is mine. Oh damn it! <laughs> no, I, I appreciate um, appreciate it. Um, we got a couple of uh, questions. We kind of touched on this before. Um, we spoke about um, spoke about your. Uh, Early early radio uh, early radio days and the uh, raw comedy um, performances. So as well as class clowns, was that like a um, was that also associated with raw comedy, or was that a separate um, a separate um, comedy night that you did as well? Uh, yeah, well, so I did class clowns again when I was fourteen, which is just, I mean, it's it's a lovely program to encourage young people to do comedy, but it's terrible at the idea that fourteen year olds should be given any kind of platform to express their views about <laughs> their um, small penises or homework. But anyway, they did that. And so I did that for two years and, and did got to the final both times. And then by the time I was 16, I was old enough to do raw comedy, which is the uh, open mic competition that's national that's supported by Triple J. And I got through to the national final that uh, that year of, of raw comedy um, when in 2006, the same year that, some lady named Hannah Gadsby. I don't know. Apparently, she's a thing, but I've never, never heard of her myself. Uh, but she was victorious that particular year. So uh, yes, I got and and Triple J saw me performing as part of that lineup, and I guess approached me and asked me if I want to do some radio stuff. Yeah. Um, yes, and then I think once you got to the grand, the final of Raw, you're not allowed to do it anymore. So from then on, I was just, just sort of addicted to and, and kept doing stand up. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I kind of, um, I really led into that question very, very rough. So I'm glad that you picked <laughs> up on that. I was basically like, so this is a comedy thing that happened. Uh, what was that like? Activate words now. Yeah, exactly. Comedy. You could tell you I was like reading. I just want people to know that it wasn't the Wikipedia page that did that. It was 100% me. I'm not about to throw an open source information center under the bus. <laughs> very kind of you. Have you gone through the raw um, situation? Um, I have done raw comedy once, but the the thing was, I realised this, and um, any other comedians out there that I've spoke to about it have not had this issue. I had so much material in the backlog because I'd been wanting to do comedy for years that by the time I had my first opportunity to do Raw, after about maybe eight months of doing comedy, I realised I had so much material but none polished. Right. So I had like 
all up probably maybe, I don't know, over half an hour or an hour of stuff that I'd done. But no two sets of mine were the same for the first 12 months. So I had all this like half polished stuff and then it was like, give us your best five minutes. And I'm just like, I don't have a good five minutes. I've got like an hour worth of five <laughs> minutes that have been done once. <laughs> I've got an okay hour. Yeah. I don't know about a good five. What are you crazy? <laughs> uh, okay is kind, but um, <laughs> so that's how I went through that. And then the second time it came round, I um I had a decent five, but I just didn't have like the because uh, I kind of balked the first time. I the second time I didn't have the confidence to say I can do it this time round. So I didn't actually get into it until like my third year. And um, by then, my jokes had evolved with me so much that they just didn't fit into like the raw format. Like it was, they were very like personalized or um, a bit dirty sort of jokes that just didn't really work with like what tends to be chosen for raw, which is like appealing to the masses. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a bit more, I, instead of just doing it when I first started, when I was kind of just doing like comedy that would make 80% of the room smirk, I got to the point by after three years where I was trying to make 30% of the room like piss themselves laughing and the other 70% walk out in disgust. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> yeah. That's not a great long-term career strategy, but could be very artistically rewarding, I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean... I'm just trying to flex in front of one of um, Australia's greats. To be honest, it was all shit. <laughs> Stop calling me that. Even ironically, it makes me feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> but it's perfect, but it must be hard, particularly in Canberra, because um, you started in Canberra, right? Yep, and, yep. And the whole time, yeah. Because, I mean, like, yeah, there's only so many rooms, right? So, of course, your, your turnover material would be really high, too, because you are... I mean, you even feel that in Melbourne, to be honest. Like, there are, there are lots of rooms in Melbourne, but you do get to the point where if you've done the same eight minutes at the one room like twice, if you've done that twice, then you do feel this this pressure to be like, I can't do that again there. I have to come up with something new. So hmm. unlike obviously America or the UK where you can do yeah four or five shows in a night in the, those capital cities and seriously yep. spend a very long time polishing a short amount of material, yeah, the turnover expectations in Australia are pretty pretty crazy. Yeah, exactly. Um, I had uh, when I first started, there was three rooms a month in Canberra. Right, that was yes. It. Um, and <laughs> I think part of what led to me um, getting that situation, as I mentioned, for my first comedy thing, is because they were so far apart. By the time the next room came up, I had like a week worth of material that I wanted to try for the for the first time. So right. I feel like having them so far apart and stage time being so um, scarce, I really wanted to try and like do as much new material as possible. Sure. Um, as well as each room was very different. Each crowd was different. So it was nearly like I had, okay, this is like Smith's Alternative, which is like a kind of like um, cafe, like a vegan cafe in the city. So I'd be like, oh, this is going to be my like, you know, um, fuck, I'm never going to buy a house because I'm like in my twenties in Canberra crowd. Um, yeah, and, right. and, th- and then I'm like, all right, now this is like the Phoenix bar in the city, which is a bunch of people have been day drinking since about 12 o'clock on a Tuesday and it's now eight thirty at night. Um, <laughs> so this is my degenerate, like how funny is it <laughs> to be an alcoholic? <laughs> crowd yep yeah and then finally there was just like a blend of both which is a, it's one of the longer running rooms in town called the front it's like a cafe in Lynham, which is like a um it's it's kind of like well at the, at the time it was different to what it is now it's um a little bit more like um <laughs> it's a little bit more um baristery now um <laughs> It's, uh, Ooh. yeah. What about the Civic? Isn't the Civic Pub a good one? Uh, so Civic Pub recently closed. Oh. It was a really good one. I did a few. That was more so like the um, paid room in town. So like the, um, like the, you know, for headliners like Tom Ballard coming through, and then a couple of us open micers would jump on there just to warm the crowd up. Um, but yeah, I um, 
that was yeah that was pretty much the run of the mill but now there's a few i run a room at a place um called the basement it's like a metal bar and um it's more of like a live music venue but on a tuesday night you know, once a month they're happy to host an open mic and it's good because um it's kind of like that big stage feel like pa fallback but it's like an open mic <laughs> cool so yeah, it's really cool. But yeah, the, we've recently opened up just before COVID. They actually uh, the, before the recent COVID lockdowns, they actually had a um, pre booking with me to run as well as the open mic once a month, a ticketed gig once a month as well. Um, and that uh, that basically just didn't didn't happen because of this. But I've got November and December um, booked for that to to host that. So we'll see how we go for a couple of local local um comedians to uh to headline that with a couple of others just keen to get are back you appealing the to the metal comedy crowd there like are you going for that venn diagram between metalheads <laughs> and comedy people or are they two different crowds it's basically just a whole room full of steve hughes um <laughs> fans yeah, right. um Andrew or whatever you say. Yeah. no it's um it's um it's it's really uh, not to be confused with Dave Hughes. Um, <laughs> um, no, we uh, yeah we do have they're both Hughesy, but uh, no. So we it was basically just a um, it's it's it is a very live music venue heavy crowd, but it's weird to like get the energy of a band when you're doing comedy. Like the crowd is trained to cheer and clap. But in our world, that is higher energy than usually what well, I'm so used to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that happens a lot of my gigs. There's a lot of moshing at my gigs as well, too. People get carried <laughs> away. People start flashing their tits. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> wow. Oh, well, actually, um, another point that um, I was going to get to with this one as well is um, you're saying about um, the Civic Pub, and that's actually where I met you for the first time. Um, and you were uh, doing a headlining set there and just like comedian, would they usually say playing to the back of the room? Well, Civic Pub, the back of the room is the bar and if you stand <laughs> there, you will um, get taken away because that's where they get the money. Um, so <laughs> um, so the, the, the equivalent to the back of the room for Civic Pub is sitting on the stairs and watching the comedian, like sticking your head out the side like the little rascals around the corner just watching the comedian <laughs> on the stage. Oh. And um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Only um, it's just uh, like a bunch of comedians and not like little rascals. Um, comedian little rascals, the equivalent. Canberra's equivalent of the little rascals. The entertainment business's version of the little rascals. Um, and uh, I remember sitting there, and um, it was it was good to see a set that was re both relatable for me, but also like in a venue that I perform at. Um, it was good to see a set of yours that you were addressing some relatable stuff I mentioned before, like house prices and and um, the the what it's like to be a young adult in. Australia's economy um and I remember there was a um there was basically like a heckler um a, a guy there was just but have you ever just seen someone that could heckle just by just looking disapproving <laughs> just emanating so there's a, there's, a dis yeah disapproving just, just you, disappointed you granddad in the front arms folded and um without giving away any trade secrets behind the curtain here, I remember um, basically it was just a matter of he said something and then it was like your response was something along the lines of like, um, you know, uh, how many investment properties do you have? And he was kind of yeah. like, oh, well, three, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the low end. It's only single digits. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Um, and it basically ends without giving away the secrets in you saying like, see, this is what a free education will get you, like a free college <laughs> education. Um, and uh, um, it kind of, and the, and to be fair, like the guy took, he wasn't sort of like a bad audience member, but it was just, it added to the show. It added a lot to the show. And I do a lot of crowd work. And I think back to that, because I think I'd only been doing comedy for a couple of years at that point, two years maybe. And now I look back at it, I'm like, that is, like, where it is, like, f 
for thinking on your feet and getting that crowd work done and like making the show relatable and like unique. Each show is like more unique with if you've got your material and a little crowd work. Have you had any like um, just phenomenal crowd work? Any stories where you've just had like some that like all the pieces of the puzzle just fell into place or like they said the f- the perfect response or something like that? <laughs> Um, look, the, and I hate to ruin the magic here, but probably the bits, the, the instances of crowd work and crowd interaction that appear to be absolute magic, probably chances are they are building on previous experiences with that same routine. So I think that boomer routine that you saw, I, you know, must've done, you know, a couple of hundred times, maybe all up across all the festivals and stuff by the time I got to doing it at the civic. So almost every iteration of, of, audience response to that both a boomer that was really into it a boomer that was against it you know you just by doing it repeatedly you eventually sort of run into most circumstances and you've probably got a few lines in the um in the holster ready to go in case something happens but and and also i was a bit bored of that routine by that point because they've done it so much so if there's anything that happens in the room that's that's very exciting and of course if someone interrupts you earlier in the routine and that you know you've got this bit coming up later on the routine that you can kind of make it look like you make it up on the top of your head and you're a very clever boy <laughs> that is a particularly sweet uh, instance of, of stand-up comedy i think i think that's really fun um but uh i think i i think during the melbourne comedy festival this year i had a, a annoying laugher in the audience and um it's it's a, such a fascinating instance of stand-up comedy because it can be very funny if someone has a really distinct laugh that everybody else can hear and that you stop and acknowledge and talk about it can be really really funny particularly if you make them laugh and they keep laughing at exactly the right moment they keep producing this really um, idiosyncratic laugh and it's very funny mm-hmm. but if you do it early on in the show at about 10 minute mark then you run a real risk of that laugh just c- continually cropping up again and again throughout the hour <laughs> and just driving everybody mental because it's just there is a point where it runs out being uh, you know, it's not funny anymore. It's just a weird and annoying, very annoying laugh that just keeps sounding exactly the same every single time. Yeah. So this year during Melbourne, I had a guy who laughed, um, who had just so it was so loud and distinctive and um, was cutting through every single time. I ignored it for about 10 minutes. Then I talked about it for about five minutes and it was probably the funniest part of the show. <laughs> And then for the rest of the hour, he didn't laugh at all, <laughs> which was kind of good. I could move on with the show. But then also, my one point, people were thinking, hang on, why isn't that guy laughing anymore? He must really hate the rest of this, of this show. <laughs> and then he laughed again within with five minutes to go. The laugh came back with that five minutes to go before the end of the show, and it got a round of applause. Oh. So uh, that was a beautiful piece of hour that we, we didn't set it up or anything, and uh, for some reason, he just knew. He just knew it was the right thing to do. So oh. moments like that feel pretty, pretty special. Yeah, yeah, that that's really good. That, that's like such a wholesome story, dude. I <laughs> the next part of that question was just like, have you had any like? Um, so this didn't happen until about maybe the three year mark of me doing comedy, and yeah, because I was doing some material that like was more like um, personal and. Um, relatable and opinionated then Mm. it obviously stirs the crowd to a point where like someone may really take offense to it and then feel the need to come up to you at the end of the show and express their concern for like how much they don't want you to ever do comedy again um now i wish i i wish i ended with the more positive like the guy laughed and got a round of applause but Um, I, I have myself, um, gotten some, um, like face to face feedback to the point where like I had to, um, basically write an incident report. Um, yeah. Yeah. But basically what it was, I, it's, it's, I, I, look, here we go. Burning another bit guys. If you tune into this podcast, you are getting a lot more than a free podcast. You are getting two of my jokes, which you don't have to come and watch me live. (laughs) You've had gift horse. We've loved that. We loved don't look a gift horse in the teeth. That was a great time. It's going to be yeah, called that. Second now. bit. Okay, amazing. Um, the second bit was actually I. I'm still going to do the bit. I don't really care. I, I want people to come out to see the bit. They'll be like, "Oh, I remember this from the podcast." <laughs> 
Yeah. Fuck. I nearly just made you put, uh, I'm assuming Peroni, but without the green screen, it's hard to tell. It's either Heineken or Peroni. No. Came out your nose just then nearly. It is Peroni. Peroni liver. Oh, it does it fade into it green, green screen. screens. It yeah, It's nearly it's like, you, it's like you oh, didn't pay weird. for a Peroni um, advertising on this podcast. There we go. Uh, it's the non-alcoholic one, though, too, because I'm a, I'm a pussy. No, it's actually, okay, here we go for joke number three. I used to have this bit about how um, people say, oh, you're weak, because I work in a bar as well, yeah, um, mm-hmm. as well as um, comedy, um, and a lot. so I get a lot of material from it, um, so that's good. Um, but here we, I used to just date people that were, like, toxic to get material, but now I can just go to work and get paid for it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, um, the bit was basically people that come and say like, oh, can I just have a light beer, but can you put it in a schooner so it looks like I'm having a full strength because I don't want people to think I'm weak. And oh. the, the bit is like, if you come to a bar and you don't drive and you like drink a case of mid of light beer just to get the same effect as a six pack, you're actually stronger than everybody else. Like <laughs> it's just like a flex that says like, man, I'm going to pay maybe 20% less money, but only be 50% as drunk as you just as like a flex <laughs> to go through the rest of my night. And I'm going to be bloated and I'm going to push through it, but I'm going to get through four <laughs> times more beer than you guys. Um, and I'm never going to wear anything aside from what is good for the temperature because it's actually weak to wear shorts and a t-shirt all year and tell everyone that you're not actually cold when you are. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah, that, there you go. There's, there's a bit for, for everybody. Um, you want to, you want to see that? You can see it at any open mic in Canberra. Just come, come towards the end of the night when the MC tends to throw me up when there's about half the crowd left anyway. And I walk the rest of them. But anyway, um, <laughs> I really think I'm a lot more badass than I am. To be fair, they'll throw me up to open the show and everyone will say, like, I could barely hear you mumbling a lot and yelling. Um, but <laughs> Mark, you got to talk yourself up, mate. <laughs> you're, you're the king of comedy in camera. Everyone should come see you. You're the best. <laughs> Gift, gift horse. Non-alcoholic bit. Um, Alcoholic beer bit. And then this one. What's this? What's the bit that you did that offended people? I'm glad that you... Smashed your face in? I'm glad you kept this in mind because just like any comedian, I will go on a tangent and two of us together, you kept me in line. It's like two tangents where of the roads just forked back together though. But um, I had this bit where I was like talking about how um, if... And this is this is what divides the room to begin with. If God is real, wouldn't he just be like a shitty manager in a retail outlet? Like he is responsible for us, right? Like you can't just say like, "Oh, you, did you read the training manual I left manual I left on the fucking tea room table for everybody to read?" There's 10 commandments in there. Did anyone do that or did you just go and do your own thing? I'll give you all these other temptations and expect you not to not to partake in them. Um, and so it's this full bit about how like God's basically a shitty manager in a, in a, in a failing retail outlet and he's no. blaming the staff because he didn't supply the accurate, the adequate training for them. Mm-hmm. I get a guy come up to me at the end of the gig and he says, uh, so you run in the comedy night, are you mate? And I'm like, yeah. And he's just like, is that what you call that up there? Comedy. And I was just like, Yeah. And uh, he's like, so can I go up there next week and, you know, slam religion? I'm like, yeah, man, actually, you'd probably fit in well. Um, and <laughs> and he's just going like, oh, you know, I'm an outstanding father of four. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, is that why you're here drunk off your ass on a Tuesday night while your wife looks after the kids or what? Um, oh, dear. Okay. All right, so you provoked. <laughs> you kept going and you kept poking the bear. But go on, yes. <laughs> um, and he basically just said, like, look, mate, I'm going to come back here next week with 20 mates and if we don't like anything that we hear, we're going to start a riot. <laughs> no. Really? Yeah, yeah. And he was a Christian? This guy was a, like I, a- I know. And I so my response was something along the lines of, like, oh, how very Christian of you. Um, yes. And- yeah, the, the low-hanging fruit. We're not talking about a professional comedian at this point. Um, 
And yeah, basically, um, it got to the point where like someone had just said like, "Oi, Jono or whatever his name was, we should uh, we should head off." And he's like, "Yeah, yeah we probably should." And like that was the end of that. Um, and he did his equivalent of apologising like two weeks later. I was working at oh, the bar. Came back. Yeah. He came so back for more. Oh, I, right. I work at that bar as well, right? Right. So okay, yeah. he comes back in two weeks later and he says, I'll get a Jack and Coke, thanks, mate. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's eight fifty. He hands me a tanner and he goes, and chuck that in the tip jar. <laughs> Okay, you interpret that as his apology for being worked up about the anti-religious material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. I see. Well, that's that's kind of Christian, I guess. That's yeah, that was his charity. equivalent of the collection plate. Yeah. It's so quaint to me. Like you know, again, I've you know, I'm it's not like I've been doing comedy forever. I started yes, fourteen. So I've been doing it in in some way or another for about 15 or 16 years. And it feels like when I started, you know, yes, religion, atheist comedy was very hot and, and was, you know, there was a level of edge to it. And that, that was the time when Christopher Hitchens kicking around at Richard Dawkins and kind of, you know, athe- the atheism conversation probably in the background of the war on terror and um, uh, the Islamophobia and, and all that kind of stuff was all very hot. And then, that just seems so quaint to me now. The idea that an audience member would be insulted that a comedian would, would in any way suggest that religion was a little bit silly it didn't make a lot of sense. You know, like it just seems. I'm not saying it's, it's like hack, but it's just sort of so. It's it feels like the conversation of taboos has moved on so much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's sort of it's sort of quite cute to remember that people used to go up there and go, God, probably not, and then people would write angry letters and storm <laughs> out of the room. It's very funny to me. I feel like you just summed up that entire joke in a short sentence, and it was funnier <laughs> than my whole bit. <laughs> no, I mean the manager thing that's probably got some legs, but it's, yeah, it's I don't know how much people think about God or, or think about God in relation to to um to their lives or yeah it's not it's not often a an area gone to for for comedy these days it seems to me yeah no absolutely i feel like what i've done here is i've had like a um super reputable guest episode 50 and yet again spoke about myself for like nearly about 35 minutes at least um right in the guts there so Mark, you're you're a comedian i'd expect nothing else you're all (laughs) best with the self (laughs) <laughs> I was trying to think about this actually, you know, in my in my lockdown craziness yep. and my just by questioning of everything about who I am and stuff. I feel like comedians are narcissists who also hate themselves at the same. I don't I don't know if there's a word for that or whatever, but like people who are obsessed with and probably have a bit of a god complex sometimes, but are also laden with um, a, a level of hatred for themselves and who they are as a person. That's which yeah. I feel like the quite a cocktail it is a weird it's like a constant battle of just being it's like i have two personalities one of them yes loves me and the other one hates the other one that loves me because it loves me (laughs) and we just live like that for the rest of forever until we die yeah exactly and one of them though and they both disappear when i get on stage oh well one disappears when i get on stage where i just try to like suppress the one that doesn't love me and then when i get off he comes back with a vengeance totally yes yeah so and then do normal people non-comedians or civilians just well-balanced people they just they don't think that they're that great but they're also much less they don't care that much they just they go much easier on themselves and just live their lives just being like hey i'm just a dude walking around trying to do some stuff that is a healthier way to live yeah, yeah, absolutely, dude. That is the one thing that I say to myself every time I'm midway through a fucking spider web of saga in my mind. Yes. Why can't I be normal? <laughs> like, a lot of, like, I remember I was showing my buddy something that I, like, um, had thought of, you know, like a podcast idea or something like that. And,. Midway through, I could just see this realization that he was just like, "Why are you doing this?" <laughs> Which you can never ask that question, okay? As a as a comedian, you should never ask. You should, you should never stop and take a really good look at your life. This has been the problem again with the pandemic, not doing stand up or anything creative for a long time. 
this is why I've spiraled into this kind of depressed, uh, weird state because I've thought about what the hell I do yep. with all my time on this planet Earth for way too long, and the answers aren't that good. The way I describe it is, I was running so fast that I had to keep running in order not to fall. <laughs> keep running. It's, Never ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's this is one thing that just fucking freaked me out as a kid. You know the old the old the 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 ad was just like, oh, the Great Wall of China was built to keep the rabbits out. My old man told me this one thing that, like, up until I was in my twenties, I believed. I said, "How fast is the world spinning?" And he said, "Fast enough that if it stopped, we'd all fly off it." <laughs> And I was like, that just reminds me of like a merry-go-round that just has had the fucking panic button pulled and everyone just flies out in all different directions. I mean, I think something bad would happen if, if the Earth stops seeing it. Spinning. But I take your point. Yeah, yes. he, has should, a, he has a good keep, point. Yes, he has a great point. But we should, yes, keep spinning um, and uh, never look at things too closely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that maybe that is the whole purpose of this podcast. But before we wrap up, um, just the last story. We didn't get quite to um, if you had any um, any um, bad walk-ups after a gig. Uh, let's close on this one and we'll do shout-outs and um, all that sort of stuff. But is there any, did you have any um, any sort of moments where you where we like got approached after a gig and you were like, oh, this could be go this could go well? The the ultimate one of those is when I was doing a gig in the Yarra Valley with a bunch of other comedians and we, we'd just done a gig and uh, we'd done pretty well. I think that at that point I was very cocky. I think I, I might have been just announced as the as the new Triple J Breakfast host. So I would actually moved there yet, but that had been out there. And uh, we'd done the gig and I'd done okay. And then we were walking back to the car and these group of guys were walking past us and they were calling out to us. Like, hey! And I automatically assumed that they must have been fans of me and my work. <laughs> and so I said, hey, guys, thanks very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> and then they started walking towards the car and started yelling a bit more aggressively and a bit more violently. And it soon became clear that they were in no way aware of my comedy work and were looking to bash some people. And so we had to get into the car straight away, drive away, and they banged on the car as we drove past. <laughs> And I had to sit in the car <laughs> for that journey with all the other comedians at the gig hanging shit on me for being so arrogant as to think that uh, these are some ballard heads who just wanted to get close to their hero. So um, that was a magical night. Oh, that's awesome, man. Holy shit. Um, <laughs> I might take that stance next time. Like I might be in a situation where I'm just – in a in a dodgy area if someone yells out i'll be like thanks man i appreciate oh, it oh it's a great way to live your life assume everyone is uh, is your fan just um just trying to get close to you and find out more about you yeah it'll it'll make you a lot happier what could you'll see them everywhere <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> absolutely man all right well um we'll do shout outs and um wrap it up with that thank you very much for being on the show um, I totally appreciate it, man. Massive milestone episode, episode fifty. I always said that um, early on that I'd like to get um, to in my mind to set a goal to have you on the show at one point because I really appreciate your comedy and um, I um, like to bring as many um, relatable um, comedians to the to the show, Australian comedians, if I can. I mean, I'm starting to branch out into the overseas market, but hey. <laughs> Maybe this is the foot in the door that they'll be like, well, Tom Ballard's been on it. That checks out. Um, <laughs> That's very sweet of you to say, Marky, and it's been a pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Yep. Um, all right, so let's um, do some online shout-outs. Once again, we uh, mentioned before we had the uh, Donate to Refugees, um, the Asylum Seeker Rescue Centre. Make sure you check out Tom Ballard's website, tomballard.com.au, and also Tom Ballard's podcast, Like I'm a Six-Year-Old. I listened to uh last few episodes, so, um, yeah, really good. There's a lot of... Uh, um, not very funny, sorry. No, there is a lot <laughs> of, like, actual good content on there, which is, let me just say <laughs> that this episode was a... Was a um, portal into actually getting some stimulating um content <laughs> from actual tom ballard's podcast um so yeah this is the gateway drug into something a lot more stimulating um <laughs> so yeah head on head on over uh to there um i listen to it on apple itunes but uh sorry on apple podcast but where else can they find it 
Uh, oh, it's on Spotify. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm so bad at any of it, but if you just look for the podcast generally, but yeah, iTunes subscribing through there is probably the way to go. Um, Spotify, or you can download it direct from Libsyn. Yeah, absolutely. Just had someone in the comments up next, Joe Rogan. So, Hey, great. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, so yeah, thank you very much for being on the show. I totally appreciate it. Um, I, you know my shout outs. I'm uh, Marky Worthington Comedy on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and Marky um, Comedy on Twitter because Worthington is too fucking long for their character limit. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, thanks very much for being on the show and uh, make sure you tune into the next episode. Cheers. Don't buy me a drink. Just name names. Yeah, yeah right. right. Big Tony. You'll get fucking thrown out of the strip club with your floppy disk. Yeah, all day. Make people feel shame for shit all day. <laughs> Don't blow Turn it. into a hard drive. Yeah, right. <laughs> <You'll get laughs> We're here to... Keep it simple. Count your money. That they're not proud of. Just give me ten bucks. Yeah, right.